Welcome to the Seth Thibodeau Show with Nichols head baseball coach Seth Thibodeau. Presented by State Farm Insurance. Contact your local State Farm agent today and get to a better state with State Farm Insurance. Hello and welcome to the Seth Thibodeau Show presented by State Farm Insurance. I'm your host, Mike Wagenheim. Coming up on today's program, we're joined by the head coach of the Colonels, Seth Thibodeau. We'll take a look at the past week's worth of highlights. We've got a feature on the assistant coaching staff and a look around the athletic department on the Colonel Connection. We start here with the head coach of the Colonels, Seth Thibodeau. Glad to have you on the program as always. Thanks, Mike. The Colonels headed to Lake Charles to take on the McNeese State Cowboys this past week and had an opportunity, a few opportunities, to clinch that series. Just couldn't come through. You stayed perfect, though, in midweek action with a win over Southern back on Tuesday. Just your overall thoughts on the past week. You know, as, as Seth Webster was lights out in a, in a complete game shutout on Friday night. Pitched really well. We didn't hit it very well and had plenty of opportunities to finish. Um, did the same thing on Saturday, really didn't swing it well, had some opportunities to really drive in some runs in some key situations and did not get the big hit. And again on Sunday we put ourselves in the same situation. So, uh, you know, against Southern we, we, we had some opportunities and we capitalized. So it was exciting to see that, exciting to see us bounce back and be able to get some big hits in those situations. And, and it's time for us to start playing consistent baseball. Well, let's take a look at the Southland series. The Colonels visited McNeese State this past weekend in league action. In the final 2011 regular season series, Nichols pulled off a miracle, sweeping the Cowboys and getting some help from around the league in order to qualify for the Southland tournament. Seth Webster getting the Friday night start, coming off his best performance of the year, a complete game victory over Sam Houston one week prior. Bottom of the first, Webster facing the Cowboys' most dangerous hitter, Seth Grange. Webster sends him packing. This was simply a sneak preview of his dominance on Friday. His counterpart, McNeese right-hander Trey Brown, he wasn't too shabby either. He set the Colonels down in order in the first. But Blake Bajeron leading off his second, swinging on the first pitch, and clobbers one off the scoreboard in left field. Second home run of the year for Bajeron, and Nichols is up by a score of one to nothing. Runs would be hard to come by after that, which made this big bash from Bajeron loom very, very large on this particular night back on Friday at Cowboy Diamond in Lake Charles. Later on in the inning, after Bajeron's blast, Michael LaGrange on second with one out. Matt Richard at the bat, facing Brown, and he singles the other way. Grange would come up throwing a one-hopper coming to the plate, and LaGrange here nailed on a bang-bang play, and it remains one to nothing. But the Colonels would return the favor. Connor Lloyd on first, and Rennie Weber rips one off the wall in right field. Lloyd misread this ball a little bit. He hesitated just a bit coming around second, and the Colonels make him pay. LaGrange to Phillip Lyons, on to Evan Weibel, and Lloyd is out at the plate. So it remains 1-0. Webster allows just one base runner over the next three innings. Bottom seventh, Michael Sullivan leading off. Looks like he's got extra bases here, but LaGrange runs it down in the alley. The Colonels committed error-free defense on the night. Nichols with a chance for some breathing room in the eighth. They load the bases on a triple and two intentional walks. Austin Flores looks like he checked his swing on the pitch, but he's rung up for the second out of the inning. Matt Richard would get a chance here. Same result. Swinging strike three, Nichols leaves him loaded. It's still 1-0 Colonels. Webster working on a six hitter going into the ninth inning here. Nick Eubanks leading off and a big whiff for strike number three. Now Sullivan would single with two outs, so the tying run is on base as pinch hitter Taylor Drake steps in. He is sunk though by the nasty slider. Webster goes the distance again. A seven hit shutout, no walks, five Ks. Brown took the loss. Eight innings, one run, eight strikeouts for Webster's counterpart. This coach, a one nothing victory, and just a classic college baseball game. No, it was outstanding. It was very well defended, very well pitched. It was a nail-biter. It was a quick baseball game, but it was what college baseball is for sure. Webster now with two consecutive complete games. He was named Southland Pitcher of the Week, Louisiana State uh, Writers Association Pitcher of the Week as well. He's finally finding himself again after a rough start to this season. He is. He made some adjustments a couple of weeks ago and has really found his groove. 
Uh, you can tell, you can see it in his eye. He was very hungry for it, and, and, and I'm not surprised at all by those last two performances, especially Friday night when we really needed him. He really stepped up and put us on his back, and he carried us. So it's good to have him back for sure. Colonels, with another Friday night win, you've been near, nearly flawless on Fridays this year. We've been very good in game one, you know, and, and now the goal is to be try to be dominant in game two and three, and I want to see that. It's something we talked about in our team meeting you know, um, on Monday. So it, uh, it's a challenge for us for this week. It's something that for us, it's a, the next challenge of the season to go as we go forward. Well, we'll take a look here as Nichols improves to four and one in weekend openers. Game two, Saturday afternoon, the Colonels go for the series victory facing righty Blake Ware, far and away the best starter for the Cowboys this season. It didn't take too long for Ware to get going. Mike Barber leading off the game. Ware goes down the pike for the called third strike. He fanned the first two batters and had four on the day. Nichols countering with Patrick Shreve, the senior southpaw with Pitchwell, but he was doomed in this one by a lack of run support. He did get some help from his defense, though first inning, two on, one gone. Philip Lyons snags the line drive off the bat at Grange and doubles up Weber at second. Shreve struck out two in a 1-2-3 second. This was a game of lost opportunities for the Colonels, though. They strand Austin Flores on third base in the second and then leave runners on the corners in the third. Ware here getting Bajeron on the pop fly we stay scoreless. Bottom third, McNeese with two runners in scoring position. One out, Weber slaps a grounder to Bofalk. Matt Henry running on contact from third. He is toast. Nichols gets out of the inning unscathed. Nichols leaves Flores on third base again in the fourth. Then in the home half of the inning, Lyons boots the routine grounder here from Grange, and the error gives McNeese a desperately needed break. Grange steals second. He moves to third on a ground out, and with two outs, Tyler Clouser at the plate and he would poke a base hit back through the middle. Grange scores the first run of the ball game, and McNeese has their first lead of the series. Top of the fifth, another chance for Bajeron with two on. He strikes it well, but Grange runs it down at the lip of the warning track. Nichols could not get that hit when they needed it. Bottom of the fifth, the Cowboys double their lead, two on and two gone for Grange, and he tags one into the right field corner. Connor Lloyd scores from second. Now the ball got stuck in the fence. You see Rennie Weber coming home here, but he would have to return to third. That run would not count, but it's 2-0 McNeese after five. Nichols batting in the sixth, runners on first and second, one out, and Ware induces Evan Weibel into the 6-3 double play. That timely hit still proving elusive. Top of the seventh inning. The Colonels load the bases for Michael LaGrange. Great opportunity here, but he fans on the breaking ball from where Nichols left 13 runners on base, including nine in scoring position. Shreve went six solid innings. Brad DeLott on to pitch the seventh, gets some help from Blake Bajeron, the diving stop, and he throws out Rennie Weber. Nichols still within reach, down by two. Now Ware issues a one-out walk in the eighth. He is pulled in favor of the closer, Michael Clemens. He would give up a base hit to pinch hitter Jeremy Hill before the Cowboys are able to get out of the inning with another double play ball. Matt Reshawn grounds to second, and the twin killing destroys another potential rally. One last chance for Nichols in the ninth. A two-out error kept the game alive, but Clemens gets LaGrange swinging at strike three, and McNeese evens his series with a two-to-nothing win. Ware allowed six hits. He fanned four, getting around four walks and three hit batsmen. Two-nothing, your final score back on Saturday. And really, Coach, that last stat I gave, we take a look. Four hit, uh, four walks, three hit batsmen. Got to take advantage of those. The Colonels Absolutely. just couldn't find a way to do it. Absolutely, and that was very frustrating for us, and, and it was something that uh, we certainly talked long and hard about. But to have our opportunities and, and, and get them again and again and again, that doesn't happen a lot, and we just didn't capitalize, and we've got to get better at that. The uh, Colonels got a decent outing enough from Patrick Shreve, and he's, he's steadily getting better as the right. season has progressed here as well. He's pitched really well, and he's given us a chance to win every time out. And, and to only give up one earned run in, the, in six innings, it, you know, he gave us an opportunity. That's all I can ask out of my starters, and, and he gave us a chance to win. They've given you an opportunity for much of the season. The rubber game on Sunday, Portsider Jason Gibson getting his second start of the year. It wouldn't last very long. Nichols amongst the national leaders in stolen bases, and they were off to the races on Gibson. Mike Barba had already stolen third. Runners at the corners here, and the Colonels execute the double steal. Bajeron takes second. Barba steals home. 
Gibson. I'd put both of them on with a walk. Mike Wisecarver, the most consistent starter for the Colonels this year, looked like he was headed toward another solid outing, a 1-2-3 first inning as he fans Nick Hubanks here to retire this side. And Wisecarver is dealing in the early going. Top of the second, a man on with two outs, and Gibson can't find the zone. The free pass to David Zorn. Then Barber draws a walk to load the bases. A full count coming up here on Phillip Lyons, and he's hit with a pitch. That forced in Austin Flores, and that did it for Gibson. He walked four and hit a batter in just an inning and two-thirds. Caleb Miller would take his place. That would do it for the starting pitcher right here. Miller didn't have a whole lot of success either. Bo Falk unloads a bases-clearing double into the corner. Nichols, after this, is up 5-0 midway through the second. That was one of two extra base hits for Falk on the day. Now, it looked like a route was coming here, but McNeese wasn't rolling over. Michael Sullivan drives one over the fence in left, a two-run shot. That was Sullivan's first home run of the year, and the Colonel lead is cut to three, and we got a ball game again. Now, Zorn would add an RBI single off of Tyler McDonald in the top of the third. That made it 6-2, to two. and then a scary moment here. Hubanks with a run-scoring double. It chases in Connor Lloyd. Rennie Weber trying to score as well. He has cut down on the relay from Phillip Lyons, but as Weber makes contact with catcher Evan Weibel, Evan's leg bends underneath him. Weibel was called out, but uh, Weber was called out, but Weibel had to lead the game. His career, in effect, is over. We'll talk more about that later. Six to three, Colonels in the fourth. McNeese begins to take away the running game. Lyons draws a leadoff walk, but he's thrown out at second. Michael Lagrange with a two-out hit, but Matt Henry guns him down too. Critical part of the Colonels' game taken away here. Nichols adds a run on a wild pitch in the sixth before Taylor Drake delivers the RBI single, little dying quail down the right field line, plating Seth Grange. The Nichols' advantage now at three. Bottom of the seventh, Wisecarver is out of bullets here. Henry hit by a pitch to start the frame. Andrew Giot follows with his single back through the box, and then Trey Rickroad, trying to bunt them along, gets nailed on the offering right here. So the bases are loaded, and this is really a tough way to end the day for Wisecarver. Donnie White would get the call out of the bullpen. The Colonel still in a situation to close this thing out. Donnie, normally reliable this season, his ERA right around one, but he misses his mark. Ball four to Weber. That forces in Henry, and it's now seven to five, Colonel. They're still loaded up. Nobody out. Hugh Banks back up at the plate, gets it into the outfield. Giot tags up on the fly out to center. McNeese would have the tying run on an error. It's seven all after seven. So we go to extra innings. The Colonel scattered eight hits off McDonald in eight innings of relief, but couldn't produce much in the way of runs. Flores takes Grange to the track and right, but the catch sends us to the bottom of the 10th. Jordan McCoy on the hill for Nichols, walks the leadoff man, a bunt and a Matt Henry single later, and there are runners at the corners with only one out. They give the uh, red light to the runner at third here. This would bring up Giot and McNeese, able to execute perfectly. They go for the safety squeeze, and McNeese wins it by a final score of 8-7 to seven to take this series. This was an especially contentious game. Both head coaches were thrown out. Both starting second basemen were tossed. This one was just a tough one to swallow. In addition to the loss, in addition to losing the series, you lose your starting catcher for the year, Evan Weibel, tearing three ligaments in his knee on that play at the plate. And This is just a tough one to swallow. It is. It's a tough one, it, but what doesn't kill you make you better. And, and so someone else has got to step up, and Cody Dufresne's got to be that guy behind the plate. But, you know, it, it would definitely needs to sink in and burn us a little bit and make us learn how to finish baseball games when we have an opportunity to do so. Well, you were able to finish on Tuesday, taking on the Southern Jaguars. Colonels remaining perfect in midweek play. This was a wild one. 14 to 11 was the final score. You found yourselves up, uh, I think, by three, then down by four, <laughs> then up by a few again. But you found a way to close right. that one out. We found a way to finish at the right time. That's all I was worried about. Didn't care about the scoreboard. Didn't care about anything else. Was finding a way to finish the game in the business innings, seventh, eighth, and ninth innings. And we did a phenomenal job of that and played lights out defense. I was very excited. Turned a big time double play. Our middle infield field did with Flores and, and, and you know, just to see those guys do it and do it being consistent with it and playing the defense we have, our, our fielding percentage has gone up big time the last two week and a half to two weeks. So uh, that's been exciting. We played lights out defense against Southern, got the big time hit. 
we didn't get it this week and got it last, you know, so it can start there. And, and so hopefully we can take that into the Corpus Christi series. Tell you what, midweek baseball is really indicative of generally is number one depth. And you seem to have that Austin Flores filling in nicely for an injured Leo Vargas. You've had David Zorn, five RBIs on Tuesday, taking the place of Jeremy Hill, though Jeremy should be back full time sooner rather than later. It's also an indication of how seriously this club takes every game, whether it's a conference game or not. And you haven't lost a midweek game. And depth and intensity, really two key factors in that. Absolutely. Our guys are goal oriented and they're hungry for some success and, and they want to be great and they want to compete for a championship and, and every game counts if you want to do that because your midweek games definitely carry over into your weekend games. You can pick up some bad habits in a midweek game if you take a day off or, or you can get yourself going for the weekend and I'm proud of that and and so I, I'm excited to see where we'll be this weekend but like you said depth has definitely been there for us and, and to have guys that to step up in key situations and key moments that that haven't been starters are in that position to begin the season they're there now and they're making plays which is very very rewarding for our club two and two week for the colonels on deck here on the seth Thibodeau show presented by state farm insurance we introduce you to the coaching staff and take you around nichols athletics including a spring football update on the colonel connection stay with us there goes dwayne's car there goes dwayne's house and there goes Dwayne. Man, that thing does not like Dwayne. State Farm's got you covered. In Lockport, call James Matassa. And in Homa, call Renee Carricker. Get to a better state. Nichols baseball is known for its heightened program and its committed student athletes, but there's a group of men who quietly and doggedly are leading the way towards an even more successful course. With a mix of coaching veterans and recent Colonel players, the Nichols coaching staff reflects its desires in its players to utilize their individual strengths to form a cohesive, effective unit. According to Director of Baseball Operations Kevin Schlegel, a former Nichols catcher, the light-hearted crew knows when to put on their game faces. It's a group of very close-knit guys. You have a mixture of very serious people who like to take everything, not very seriously, but they're, they're, um, they're serious when they need to be, and then they have a good time when, um, when, they're, not away from, or when they're away from the team and stuff like that. Um, you also have a mix of the guys who like to joke around. It's a good group. We know when to have fun, but at the same time, we know when to buckle down and get serious and get after it, and I think the players really feed off that. Well, it's very easy for us to work together because we're all on the same page. We know what our expectations of ourselves are, and it starts with our head coach and what he expects of us and each of our duties. Uh, we all have one goal in mind, and that's to be as good as we can be. And uh, we're all pulling for one goal, and that's for those guys in the locker room to, to just be as good as they can be. And so it's easy for us to work together. A lot of these guys that are on our staff either played here or are very close with us, and, and, and they know what's expected. We want to work hard. We want to play hard. We want to have fun. Uh, but that comes in with putting the time in, in the office, on the field, whatever it may be. We're going to do whatever it takes to be special. Uh, one thing Coach Tibb has, has said several times, that the most important thing you can do is surround yourself with good people, and I think we've done that with our coaching staff, and I know we've done that with our players. We're very proud of our players. Whether the staff is stern or comical, the players see them as a group knowledgeable about the game and ready to get down to business. I believe in hard work. Um, I believe in... Uh, treating the kids as I would want, like to be treated. Uh, I believe putting them through um, stuff that I can do right now and not just uh, tell them to do it because. Um, I think that if, I, um, I can do, if I'm telling them to do something, I should be able to do it myself. Um, that's why I firmly believe in um, is, is working as hard as you can. And um, I think if, if you can do the stuff that you're saying out of your mouth, it, it means a whole lot more coming, uh, from the player's perspective. One of the major strengths for pretty much everyone on this coaching staff is that we're all fairly young. We're all not very far removed from being in a position that the players are in, our players are in right now. I think that we've all been 
through this and we've all we're red shirts so we're all in it for five years so the experience and knowing what these guys are going through it makes it a lot easier for us to relate to them and be on the same level with them as far as their thinking. While past experiences help the coaches connect with the players, the staff realizes that they are still students of the game in some respects. Even as they dispense their wisdom, they recognize there is still room to improve themselves as well. I think that I have a good, I think one of my strengths is I have a good overall base of knowledge for the game of baseball. I think I can bring ideas and ways of doing things defensively, offensively, in the pitching game. I haven't been a pitching coach here for the last couple of years, now being the hitting coach, that it, uh, it, it helps with our staff. I think weaknesses are, uh, weaknesses I think I'm a little too emotional sometimes. I think that's easy for me to say that's a weakness of mine. I think I, I tend to be real high and real low. I think that you know, it's easy for me to do that, to let it get out of hand a little bit. So I think if I could try to be a little bit more even keel, that'd be great. And I'm working on it every day. While Prother has more than six years of instructional experience under his belt, Schlegel's career is just getting started. He still remains close to his former teammates as he adjusts to life in a role that demands a more authoritative stance. It's hard for me to, you know, tell some guys I've played with, hey, go do this, go do that, because that's not the person I am. Um, but. I'd say my biggest weakness is I just don't have enough experience, but at the same time I'm learning quickly on my feet um, as best as I possibly can and as fast as I can. Um, strengths wise, um, I'd say I'm, I'm the youngest guy on the coaching staff, so I kind of know what they've been through. I know um, what they're going through and kind of how to um, reiterate to them and talk to them about um, what they need to do and how, what they need to get better at and what they need to improve on. I believe some of my strengths are um, my experiences that I've had uh, playing baseball. I've done it almost at the highest level you can. I believe uh, bringing my experience and, and the stuff that um, I went through um, is, a, is a big factor in helping these kids uh, get through it because I've been there through it. I've had a lot of arm problems. I've had a lot of ups and downs. I've been as high as you can, as low as you can, and I think uh, those experiences um, are, are good to help those guys get through those points. Understanding the ups and downs of life in the Colonel program gives the coaches an advantage. Prothrow has had a front row seat as he's watched his former players become colleagues and equals. I'm very proud to work with these guys. You know, there's three of them on our staff now that have played for myself and Coach Thibodeau in the program. And very proud to watch those guys grow up, you know, and they're totally different as people, as young men. Uh, their amount of responsibility they can handle, how mature they are. It's been fun to watch them grow and been fun to watch how good they are at their jobs, you know, how good they've gotten and how much better they'll be. I know that, you know, that we're going to continue to get better, all of us hopefully. We won't be as good as we can, but the potential is still there that we saw them when we recruited them and when they played for us. But uh, we learn from those guys now and they teach us stuff every day and it's been fun to work with those guys in a different way. Instead of just coaching them, you get to work with them. For this coaching staff, the proof of their success is easy to quantify. A consistently better product on the field combined with success in the classroom and a presence in the community shows that this cast has struck a perfect balance. For the Seth Thibodeau Show, I'm Ashley Bull. Thank you very much, Ashley. The Colonel Connection is up next with news from around Nichols Athletics. You're tuned in to the Seth Thibodeau Show, presented by State Farm Insurance. <laughs> There goes Dwayne's car. There goes Dwayne's house. And there goes Dwayne. Man, that thing does not like Dwayne. State Farm's got you covered. In Thibodeau, call Doug Robichaux. And in Luling, call Keith Davis. Get to a better state. The Nichols football team kicks off spring practice under the motto, Band of Brothers. And the softball team looks to build on the positives from last weekend's series against Stephen F. Austin. That is all coming up on this week's Colonel Connection.
The football team began their spring schedule on a mission to further their bond as the Colonels concentrate on their fundamentals and chemistry to turn around their disappointing 2011 campaign. Head coach Charlie Stubbs focuses on bringing the offense up on his scheme. Well, first of all, it all starts with alignment and assignment. And again, I want us to line up. We run so many different formations. I want us to line up crisply. And then on our assignments, I want us to know exactly what we're doing on given play, so our execution to go. I really believe once they know those two things, they'll be able to play fast. And we've got some very good athletes, but when they're confused, they're going to be hesitant. On the defensive side of the ball, Stubbs envisions a more opportunistic unit going into next season. But the biggest thing about the defense right now, it is fundamentals. You know, I want them to be able to really fly around on defense and pursue at the proper angles. And I want them, when they get an opportunity to create a turnover, I want them to make it happen. Nichols will cap off their spring festivities on April 21st with their spring scrimmage game. Junior running back Jesse Turner and company focus on leaving everything on the field. I would like to see like everybody on the same page, um, everybody uh, happy the way they left the field this spring, because everybody wants to get better and everybody wants to get on the same page as one another. And if everybody just come off the field that the last spring practice and be um be satisfied with their performance this spring. It'll be very a very successful spring. The softball team split the series against Stephen F. Austin last weekend, snapping their eight game losing streak. The Colonels then swept southeastern Louisiana in a doubleheader this Tuesday. The women continue conference action at home against Texas State this weekend. Head coach Angel Santiago and assistant coach Jessica Seaman look forward to the challenge the Bobcats represent. With Texas State, they definitely have a reputation of being one of the top teams in the conference. Um, they seem to be very disciplined, so we're going to have to really capitalize on our opportunities. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be some close games. Uh, it really comes down to the pitching, and uh, apparently they have some pretty good ones. But, um, you know, Texas State was picked to finish first in the conference, and we want to do something about, um, about that. For the Set Thibodeau Show, I'm Philip Boudreau with your Colonel Connection. Thank you very much, Philip. We're with you here on the Seth Thibodeau Show, presented by State Farm Insurance. Mike Wagenheim, alongside the head coach of the Colonels, Seth Thibodeau. You've got Texas A&M Corpus Christi in Southland action here at Didier Field coming up this weekend. What are your thoughts on the Islanders? You know, the Islanders are, are going to come in, they're going to pitch it, and this will be the best pitching staff they've had in years. Um, they're not quite as explosive offensively as they've, they have been, but they don't really need to because they've, they've been better at playing defense and pitching. So I feel like we're going to be able to pitch it and play defense as well. The key is is for us to overcome what we, we couldn't do against McNeese, which is drive in the big run, get the timely hit that we haven't gotten the last few, you know, few series. So we need to do that this weekend. We need to separate ourselves a little bit with our schedule right now and, and take care of our business. You're four and five in conference right now. This team doesn't seem like it should be four and five. No, and it doesn't sit well with them either. And I know it, it's bothering them as much as it bothers us. And, and we've, but we've had opportunities to win three series in a row. We haven't played our best baseball on Saturday and Sunday the last couple of weeks, and that's something we need to do a better job of. But it's being able to get the timely hit, the timely play, the timely pitch, and it's time to do that now. All right, Coach. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, we'll talk Mike. again next week. For Head Coach Seth Thibodeau, along with the crew, Philip Boudreau and Ashley Bull, I'm Mike Wagenheim. We will talk to you again next week here on the Seth Thibodeau Show, presented by State Farm Insurance every Thursday at 3.30 here on Cox Sports Television. In the meantime, we'll see you out at the ballpark this weekend, beginning Friday at 6.30 as the Colonels face the Islanders. Take care. <laughs>